Okay, welcome to the Burger and Forum, everyone. Um, I do have just two announcements. Um, first, tomorrow in the Environmental Studies Speaker Series, we have um, Zach Edwards, the son of Steve Edwards and Pat Edwards, who's known to most of you. He lives in the Adirondacks these days and he's giving a talk entitled Discovering Personal Potential in the Outdoor Space. And next week's Burger and Forum will be um, Colleen Wall giving a talk entitled Let's Punch Each Other, Experiences of Power in Boxing. Sounds very interesting, but I can't remember <laughs> what else it's about. Um, today, our speaker is Mitch Murbach, and I'm going to let others introduce him. So I'm going to hand over now to Gary Ostrauer. Yeah, we have two introductions today. And for years, I've wanted to say what I'm going to say uh, in just a moment. Uh, I've taught uh, about uh, over 8,000 students, between eight and 9,000 students. And uh, some of them have been outstanding. Uh, I had one from uh, who got a, a medical degree from Harvard and then a PhD from University of Rochester Medical School. Another became a congressman. Another became a, a nationally known lawyer. Another became the chief of staff to the vice president of the United States, Walter Mondale, back in that time. Some of you may have heard uh, Tyler Maroney when he was here last year, uh, who gave a wonderful Bergen Forum, I thought, uh, about private eyes. He had a, a six page review, a six page review for his relatively new book in The New Yorker. Uh, and then, of course, there's Miriam Lurie Crumbach, who I consider to be uh, one of my favorite potters. But the best single student that I have taught uh, in my entire uh, career teaching, 54 years now, not just here, but at Vassar, at University of Pennsylvania, at Aarhus in Denmark, uh, was, is the, uh, the, the speaker uh, today for our Bergen Forum. Uh, and just as impressive as his publications uh, and his visiting professorship at Yale or his classroom accomplishments is the fact that Mr. Murbeck is the father of triplets. Now, you didn't come, <laughs> you didn't come to hear me. So I'm going to turn this over to Dean Lauren Lake, uh, who will say a few words after we will hear from Mitchell Murbeck. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Um, well, it's my pleasure, and thank you, Gary, for, for asking me to do this, to introduce to you um, Mitch Murbeck, <clears throat> who studied and received his degree from Alfred University in 1985, uh, where he studied yeah. in the School of Art and Design, as, as well as with Gary. <laughs> he, he worked in sculpture and painting conservation at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, and later went on to study art history at the University of Chicago, receiving his master's degree and his PhD um, in 1995. His many book accomplishments include The Thief, The Cross, and The Wheel, Pain, and the Spectacle of Punishment in Medieval and Renaissance Europe, uh, which brought him critical acclaim and multiple awards. His book, Pilgrimage and Pogrom, The Violence, Memory, and Visual Culture at the Host Miracle Shrines of Germany and Austria received um, um, much press. He has edited, I think someone is, excuse me. Um, uh, his many articles uh, from that project and others have received multiple awards, including the author Kingsley Porter Prize um, and uh, fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at the Harvard Un University and the Clark Institute and the uh, American Academy in Berlin. Uh, Mitch is the Arnell and Everett Land Professor in History of Art at Johns Hopkins University and um, we welcome him to our Bergen Forum. And may I just say very quickly, if everyone can please, please mute themselves. Okay, if you could just uh, hit mute so you're on mute. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for, all, for all those introductions. Um, before launching into my presentation, I want to extend a special thanks to Emery's Westacott for the kind invitation to speak today at the Bergen Forum. And uh, certainly my dear friend and revered history professor, Gary Ostrauer, for suggesting the idea. Truly all these years, I've been hoping to return to Alfred to share a bit of what I've learned since graduating in 1985. And I can't think of a better vehicle than the Bergen Forum, unless of course you wanna invite me for this year's commencement address. Um, but it is an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. 
So I have two overlapping goals for the next 25 minutes or so. One is to give you a little introduction to my most recent book and perhaps uh, whet your appetite for reading it. Second, I wanna reflect on some of the dangers and opportunities that are involved whenever we art historians or any humanities scholar for that matter, create or discover new categories for the objects we study. For better or worse, we often think and speak about our objects, in this case, works of art, uh, with and through existing categories. And this is healthy, so long as we don't let the categories think us. Uh, that is, so long as we continually criticize, refine, and remake the categories we depend on. I'm gonna change my screen a little bit here. Okay. So let me start then with this question of categories, taking what is perhaps the most extreme case of the tendency to treat art objects categorically without realizing that's what we're doing. I refer to the tendency to conceive of art objects as containers or boxes of meaning, containers that require a special effort or a special set of tools to open them. Historically, this has been the source of a great deal of mischief and misdirection in the study of art. And it was among the intellectual problems that led me to write an entire book dealing with one very notorious instance. Make sure I'm changing my slides here. The engraving Melancholia I by the German painter and printmaker Albrecht Dürer of Nuremberg, who you see in a portrait medallion made when he was at the undisputed height of his powers and fame. Now, the first thing you need to know about Melancholia uh, the engraving, is that there is a ridiculous overabundance of scholarly interpretations concerning it. At least a dozen serious monographs, hundreds of dedicated articles, thousands of other miscellaneous commentaries scattered everywhere you look. A historiographic situation as impressive as it is embarrassing to those of us who perpetuate it. Its very existence compels us to ask a fundamental question. What do art historians expect will happen? Where do we expect interpretation will lead when we consider a picture to be like a locked box that requires a special key to unlock it so we can get at the meaning inside? The stakes in this question become clearer when we employ a closely related metaphor, the picture as a puzzle. Now, as you know, a picture or a picture puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle, as they're commonly known, is a collection of fragments meant to fit together to form a coherent whole. Each fragment possesses a distinctive contour and a limited set of adjacencies. Each piece carries one pre-assigned position within the whole, one and only one, so you must assemble it correctly in order to solve it. Puzzles present a challenge to our wits and to our knowledge. They inspire us in a certain sense of wonder because as we work them out, we can't help but marvel at the ingenuity of their devising, uh, the craftiness of those who have devised them, and maybe also our own skill in solving them. Thus has it been for nearly 500 years with the engraving Melancholia, one of the three so-called master engravings that Dürer produced between 1513 and 1515. The other two being his image of St. Jerome seated in a luminous study there on the left, and the image of his badass armored knight riding through a haunted forest, generally called Night, Death, and the Devil. But whereas the signs and symbols that make up the other two engravings can mostly be made to add up to a single coherent meaning, melancholia has consistently been declared a riddle image or a puzzle image, um, especially with regard to its weird array of objects, symbols, and living beings. Within a surreal atmosphere, we see a winged genius brooding, her bright eyes piercing the shadows, her head crowned with a garland and pressed against a clenched fist. Seated next to her on a millstone, a puto is writing or carving with a tool of some sort, while a lanky dog slumbers at their feet. Around them are numerous implements and devices, a sphere, a strange monolith, and a scatter of tools, a ruler, a handsaw, and a plane, all lying there discarded, it seems. Half hidden beneath the shadows, uh, but behind uh, Melancholy's robe, near some nails, I don't know if my cursor, so we're over here in the lower, the lower right, 
uh, is a syringe of some sort, or perhaps the tip of a bellows. Other things are deposited all around, a template in the picture's lower left, and an ink pot, and a hammer. On the far side of the monolith sits some kind of brazier, and another vessel nested within it, surrounded by flickering flames. A ladder rising from somewhere out of view is propped against a mysterious windowless building. Hanging from the wall is a balance, an hourglass, a sundial, and a bell. And below the bell set into the wall is a numerical chart divided into 16 cells. In the distance, a rainbow arcs across the horizon while a celestial body of some kind blasts its radiance in every direction. From out of nowhere, a bat or a bat-like phantasm flutters into view and on outstretched wings, the creature heralds the picture's title, Melancholia One. Now, given this confusing collection of signs and symbols, it's hardly any wonder that Melancholia has inspired such a dizzying range of interpretations. It's been called Das Bilder Bilder, the image of images, or as I like to say, the mother of all interpretive challenges. The most influential of these interpretations have brought the image into relation with a text of some kind and have therefore sought to discover a hidden discourse behind the image. That discourse could be moralistic, for example, the symbolism of time or death. It can be proto-scientific or occult, such as the alchemist's vision of transformation. It could be aesthetic, for example, Durer's quest for platonic beauty through mathematics, or it could be spiritual or epistemological, uh, the stages of ascent into knowledge of God. And I'm really just referring to uh, many past interpretations. <clears throat> Each interpretation in this grand procession has shared in the venerable project of, of understanding the picture as a special kind of puzzle, or to use the preferred term from literary studies, an allegory. The term allegory, you may know, descends from the Greek allegoria, combining the, uh, the word allos, other, and agoria, which means speaking. So each interpretation imagines it to be a philosophical or a theological statement of some kind, a verbal artifact, in a sense, masquerading as a picture. Interpretation then becomes an effort to tear off the disguise. All the symbols must be identified and all the abstract concepts behind them brought to light. Doing so helps us discover that ultimate key which, quote, unlocks the door to meaning, or to borrow a metaphor so beloved in the world of Dan Brown novels, you have to break the code in order to solve the puzzle. Then and only then will the picture yield up its meaning. <clears throat> now, it's this very expectation that I resist in my book, Perfections Therapy. And the starting point is what I see as the engraving's own resistance to a single unitary meaning. To many readers, this will come as a disappointment. After all, we've been taught that interpretation must have its final reward, its big payoff, the thing that gets you published or employed or the chance to do a Bergen Forum or even a TED Talk. Persuasive interpretations, especially when they're complex, arouse this kind of fanfare and the best ones can exert a certain kind of authority too. If ever there was one interpretation of Durer's melancholia that exerted this kind of authority, it's the one first put forward in a 1923 monograph co-authored by Erwin Panofsky and Fritz Sexel, two art historians associated with the research library founded by Abi Warburg in a luxury townhouse in Hamburg, Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Barberg, by the way, was born from a wealthy Jewish banking family, but didn't go into the business. Uh, he spent all of his money on books. <clears throat> At its founding, it was called the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek, the Library for Cultural Historical Research. And in 1933, under threat from the new Nazi government, it had to be moved to London, where it survives as the Warburg Institute. In its heyday, the library attracted a diverse community of philosophers and philologists, art historians, and orientalists, and some figures of enormous stature like uh, Ernst Cassirer. Uniting them was Abi Warburg's interdisciplinary vision, and of course, the books. Uh, by the time uh, he died in 1929, Warburg's collection counted over 60,000 volumes. 
Now I'm making a short detour here to give you an idea of everything that went into that interpretation put forward by these Warburgian scholars. With the success of their 1923 publication, Panofsky and Saxel set out to produce an expanded and updated second edition. This opened the door to a collaboration with Raymond Klebanski, a German Canadian historian of philosophy who was still a graduate student at the time. The result was the iconic interdisciplinary tome weighing in at 400 pages, Saturn and Melancholy. And it's really astonishing to absorb all that this book covers. Um, you have to read it to believe it. First, a comprehensive medical and philosophical history of melancholy, the ancient ancestor of modern clinical depression. That's just part one. Part two of the book covers the myth and literary tradition of the planetary deity Saturn from his ancient origins through Hellenistic and Islamic astrology to the medieval Christian moralization of Saturn as well as his representation in the visual arts down to the Renaissance. Part three evaluates the transformation of melancholy in Florentine Neoplatonism, which gave birth to the modern notion of melancholy as being the kind of the blessing and the curse and the foundation of all intellectual and artistic genius. Then finally, the analysis of Durer's engraving, the iconographic background to its symbols and motif the place of, the, of its personification in the history of types and Durer's own understanding of melancholy, all leading up to a full explication of the engraving's meaning. This is really interdisciplinary humanities research on an epic scale. Now, in the view of these scholars, it was Durer's bold stroke to transform the medieval imagery of geometry into an allegory of an inspired melancholy, that is the temperament of intellectual and creative genius. Its modern personification appears in Durer's fascinating dark-faced spirit. She is portrayed in quiet meditation, unable to realize what theoretical reflection has brought into view. Despairing of the limitations of all human art, she's an inherently tragic figure, suffering something like the modern artist's failure of creative nerve. Panofsky, who masterminded this interpretation from its earliest uh, incarnation, ultimately judged this brooding figure to be a self-portrait, a spiritual self-portrait, he called it, of the artist himself. <clears throat> now this classic interpretation would soon be joined by others, many others, as I've suggested. And in the book, I describe how the dominance of, one in, of that one interpretation gave way to an overcrowded field of competing and contradictory accounts, a labyrinth of meaning from which there still seems to be no escape. By the mid 1980s, several commentators were actually entertaining the notion that Durer had engineered a kind of permanent ambiguity, implanting deep into the prince symbolic program an essential contradictoriness of Widerspruchlichkeit that could never be resolved. In the face of all this, in 1991, a German art historian by the name of Peter Klaus Schuster published a two volume monograph, two volumes that wove together nearly every strand of existing research into a totalizing picture of Durer's overinterpreted image. He did not, however, <laughs> propose anything conceptually new, at least in my view, so Schuster's project really represents a kind of end game in that collective effort to crack the Durer code. One that in my view reveals the essential bankruptcy of the whole endeavor. Of course, nothing will ever dampen the enthusiasm of all those psychiatrists, mathematicians, symbologists and code breakers, all of them seeking the Holy Grail. For instance, the philosophy professor from Würzburg, Leonhard Richter. Richter's practically unreadable book claims to have unlocked the proof that the engraving is, surprise, an elaborate exposition of the writings of another philosopher, in this case, Pico della Mirandola. As the French say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. <clears throat> Instead of dwelling on melancholia's undecidability, I decided to ask a different question. What kind of values attach to an image that resists interpretation, 
or that purposefully poses challenges and difficulties to understanding. I argue that Durer has found a way to make our aesthetic experience of the print, our effort to find order in the visual chaos he's created, uh, found a way to reflect our cognitive experience of the print, our effort to wrestle meaning out of it. The key term here is effort. What we have in melancholia is an object designed to set our perceptual and mental faculties in motion and to keep them in motion so long as we're engaged with the image. And this brings us to the million dollar question. What purpose is served by this mobilization of human faculties when there's no guaranteed payoff, no theory or doctrine to be communicated, no tragic dilemma or moral lesson to be learned, no authoritative content. Do we retreat into the fashionable position that the image simply admits multiple levels of meaning? Do we adopt the more radical view that our frenzied rush to interpret reveals nothing more and nothing less than our, the essential meaninglessness of all pictures? Or is there another path to take? My gamble in the case of Durer's melancholia was to give what the what value does it have question an unexpected one word answer, the therapeutic. In a nutshell, my argument is as follows. By engaging with this very special engraving, its perplexing structure and its symbolic disorder, beholders find themselves enjoined to a particular kind of cognitive effort. We network from one object to another, one figure or attribute or symbol to another. We make associations here and there as befits our learning, our curiosity, our imagination, and our experience. Maybe we get sidetracked. Maybe we get hung up on the magic square. You'll see why in a few moments. Maybe we get totally derailed, but we keep going until we're ready to do something else. What we're not doing is systematically disassembling and reassembling a puzzle, neurotically grasping for knowledge, or trying to arrive at a correct solution that will somehow end all subsequent need for interpretation. This is a modern idea. Open-ended contemplation of the kind I'm describing was understood by medieval and Renaissance intellectuals as a type of spiritual and ethical conditioning. In short, a form of mental exercise. Thinking itself works to recalibrate the mind and counter the downward pull of the passions. What counts, what leads us toward balance, moderation, and health is not the particular content of thought, but the free exercise of our most treasured human faculties, reason, imagination, and memory. Wander mindfully through the picture and you succeed in taming what has been called for well over a thousand years, the wandering mind, the distracted mind. So where does melancholia come into all of this? Well, to me, it's clear that Durer, who was acknowledged as a melancholic genius by no less a figure than Philip Melanchthon, and who styled himself that way in several of his self-portraits, uh, here on the left is one of his earliest self-portraits done when he was uh, a journeyman, uh, and he's, uh, he's assumed that classic uh, uh, head and hand pose associated with melancholy. And on the right is a, is a small sketch he, he, he made apparently to consult a doctor. Uh, he's pointing to what may be his uh, spleen or pain in his side. And the inscription says, uh, uh, the, yellow, the yellow area to which I'm pointing, that's where the pain is. And this has also been interpreted as an uh, indication of his melancholic malaise since the spleen is the organ that produces uh, bile. Anyway, it was Durer who understood that it was precisely those who bear the gift and the curse of melancholy who needed this kind of mental rebalancing the most. From the earliest identification of melancholia as an illness, uh, Greek medical writers placed it on the line separating a clinical syndrome from a functional psychosis, and they defined it variably as an acute or chronic condition. To blame were those disturbances in the equilibrium among the four humors, the so-called four humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, organic substances whose optimal mixture signaled health. Persons with a higher concentration of black bile, malena cole, were apt to be cold, 
and dry like autumn, the season in which these symptoms were ascended. Gloominess and despondency, fastidiousness and cupidity, these were the hallmarks of the so-called melancholic temperament. Also to blame for the condition were the ill effects of the planets, in particular, the dark planet Saturn. Astrological medicine, an ancient discipline, claims that planetary radiances influence the body and minds of all living creatures. To maintain the right balance, the astral gods must be appeased and properly channeled or counteracted with the influence of others. Saturn and Jupiter, for example, were considered countervailing fo cosmic forces. The former produced malignant effects, the latter cheerful ones or jovial ones. And this is why, according to a longstanding interpretation, Durer planted the 16 cell numerical chart, the so-called Jupiter square, into the wall behind Lady Melancholy. The convergence here of astrological medicine and Arabic number theory has made the Jupiter square the object of intense interest among mathematicians, symbol hunters, code breakers, and other adepts of the esoteric. Uh, we could get really sidetracked, but I wanna give you a taste of this um, uh, as a uh, so-called magic square. And there are many types of these, uh, these squares. The um, combinations of numbers uh, all add up to the same number, 34, whether you take the horizontal rows or the vertical rows, uh, whether you take diagonals through the, uh, through the numbers, whether you take um, uh, quadrants of four in each of, the, in each of the four quadrants of the square, also add up to 34, uh, as do the four corners, as do the, uh, the numbers following the corner squares in clockwise position and in counterclockwise position, um, the four center squares, and even some, uh, some kite configurations add up to, there are uh, 86 combinations that all add up to 34. <clears throat> the important thing to remember is that Durer, with his extensive contacts among Nuremberg's scholarly and scientific community, would have had a two-sided understanding of melancholia. One side grounded in the tradition of natural medicine and the theory of the four humors, the other informed by astrology and occult philosophy. In a complementary way, he would have understood that the treatment of melancholia had to be multi-pronged. That is, it had to encompass medical, dietetic, magical and psychological therapies. Furthermore, he would have understood that the artist, poet, or philosopher who sought relief from the contradictory symbols, symptoms, excuse me, symptoms of melancholy could never realistically hope for a total cure, but only an alleviation of symptoms, a temporary rebalancing of the system that permitted a return to work, a return to aspiration. Now, something like a therapeutic purpose for the melancholia engraving was envisioned long ago by the incomparable Abby Varberg, who you see here now, whose library, as I mentioned earlier, fostered and facilitated all that early research. Varberg argued that the Jupiter square above Lady Melancholy's head mobilized mental con concentration in a particular way, and that it would, quote, enable the melancholic to transmute his sterile gloom into human genius, end quote. For Warburg, this qualified the engraving as a humanistic comforting image, a Trostblatt, since in his view, the victory over Saturn's dark forces had already taken place in the, in the scene Durer envisioned. And the credit for this victory belongs to the thinking being herself, the thinking being portrayed in the picture. This made it, in his view, an emblematic image of creative thought's triumph over the ancient demons that haunted the Renaissance imagination. Now taking Varberg's insight several steps further, my argument in perfections therapy turns out to be rather simple. What the engraving offers is not only a diagnosis of melancholy, its despair and its delusions, but also an instrument for remedying it. According to my theory, it's the natural meditative activity of the beholder that advances the cause of healing. Such activity arises from a steady, 
measured concentration that's exemplified by the female personification because the print structure in a way demands it. Also, I think because her state of absorption encourages the beholder to identify with her and even project uh, our own cognitive labors upon her. It's a form of concentration that overcomes confusion, tempers the passions and banishes dark forces, a therapeutic movement of the soul away from its state of distress. For the ailing subject, such a rebalancing is at once psychological and physical, moral and medicinal. And that I contend is the conceit of the image. Now throughout his career, Durer made it part of his practice to explore new image categories, types and functions that lay, beyond, that lay at the boundaries of what he prescribed for future generations of artists. It was above all with his printed works that Durer succeeded in clearing new spaces within the traditional hierarchy of subjects. Melancholia I is probably the ripest fruit of that effort. Perhaps we have to say and have to admit that it's, about, it's a bit overripe. For one could use the same logic to call Melancholia a failed experiment, a one-off masterpiece in a new genre that admitted no further development. Now, even if we conclude that Melancholia is the first and last of Durer's great experiments in this novel genre of imagery, it can be furnished with a context. In the book, I offer something like a short history of what I call the therapeutic artifact from the ancient world to the 16th century. Everything from amulets for chasing away the demons that threaten women with miscarriages, engraved healing stones that held close to the body, pilgrimage badges that had, had absorbed the sacred powers of the holy shrine when the pilgrim went there, or devotional images that guided the mind back to God. Within this larger scheme, I see special attention, I, I give special attention to the development of images specifically designed to foster uh, what I call speculation. Because my time is ticking down, I'll explain this very briefly. What I'm calling speculative images have their origin in medieval diagrams, which were often circular, uh, in a sense, theoretical maps that organize knowledge for the sake of transmission and memory while also encouraging the subject of knowledge to make him or herself the object of knowledge as well. There's a reflexive character then to all speculative imagery and it comes to the fore uh, really when we look outside scientific contexts as in this roundel made for an English Psalter. It basically is showing you uh, the 10 stages of human life from infancy in the lower left uh, through adolescence and adulthood down to old age and all the way down to decrepitude and death uh, at the bottom uh, once again. Here we find medieval speculative imagery structured in a way to offer the beholder a metaphorical vantage point outside him or herself. In Latin, a specula is a watchtower, a high vantage point for surveying the whole. And that's uh, the position of Christ's face uh, at the scent at the hub of this turning wheel is, is indicating that. He says, I, I govern the whole with reason in that inscription around him. But a speculum, remember, is a mirror, a device that reverses the relation between subject and object and forces us to examine ourselves in the process. Both specula and speculum provide a special form of looking that merges observation of the natural world, in this case, the stages of human life, with an intensive examination of self. So mirror metaphors and mirror motifs are especially prominent in speculative images. Uh, this woodcut, for example, called the mirror of reason is, is really kind of simulating a, uh, a convex mirror that could be hung on the wall and then looked into, or if one looks into it and sees uh, the theme of the pilgrimage of life. In prompting self-reflection, and sustaining it as a form of spiritual exercise, speculative images become instruments of a, the of a, the of a, th a therapeutic practice. That's, that's my, my main point. So speculative images perform their office by engaging the beholder's natural desire 
to forge insights about the world and about the self. And for this reason, I've coined another term, therapy by proxy, to account for the way that efficacy becomes a product of the subject's self-activity rather than something transposed from an external source. Uh, to explain this contrast, I often borrow from uh, modern pharmacology, the distinction between drugs that have a direct therapeutic effect, such as antimicrobials that target uh, specific pathogens in the blood or tissue, on the one hand, and on the other hand, drugs that stimulate immune responses, enabling the body to do the work of combating infection and disease, like our modern vaccines so much on our minds today. Both types of drugs act upon the natural body, but only the latter produces its therapeutic effects by mobilizing the body's own resources, its own healing powers. Since ancient times, doctors treated melancholy with everything from warm baths, herbal decoctions, purgatives, bloodletting, enemas, poultices of every conceivable recipe, as well as friendly conversation, music, and even sexual intercourse, uh, so long as it's not too vigorous, was thought to help melancholy. But all medical authorities whose recommendations have been preserved in the sources recognize the value of gentle exercise for both body and the mind. Uh, any kind of steady concentration that would still the passions, bring about relaxation, give the mind and the body a chance to recalibrate and to heal. So if there is a next stage to this project, and I, and I hope there will be, I have two things in mind. On the one hand, carrying this notion into other case studies of philosophical images, such as uh, Giorgio Gysi's Allegory of Life, which you see here. Uh, this is just one of art history's many, many puzzle images that may, upon closer inspection, turn out to be therapeutic images. And this in turn will allow a broader rethinking of those cherished categories by which the healing power of art has been described. So a second prong would entail a more thorough critique of modern attempts to chart the, te the therapeutic potential of art, such as the one undertaken by philosopher Alain de Botton several years ago. Art has many functions in a complex global civilization, but at a time when so much is desperately out of balance, bodies, minds, human relationships, the very earth we inhabit, attending more closely to the therapeutic seems to me a useful thing for a humanity scholar to do. So I wanna thank you for your attention and that's the end of my presentation. Um, well, thank you, Mitch. Um, and uh, we'll turn it over to questions. Uh, sorry, we'll, looks like there's you. one. We'll turn it over to questions. Uh, there might there's be one, one in the chat. Gary in the chat. Um, Gary asked, do your work during the period defined by Luther and the intensity of the Reformation, yet you've not mentioned religion at all, can you address the degree, if any, to which the new Protestant theology influenced him? Or did he produce his art without reference to Luther, who he once painted, and without reference oh. to religion? Well, uh, Gary, you've touched upon a monumental question within Durer scholarship. Uh, there are many, many shades of opinion on this question. Uh, we know that we know that Durer, from his own from his own statements, was in fact uh, moved by uh, by Luther's teaching and was um, especially disturbed during the period when uh, when Luther was um, uh, uh, kidnapped or taken to the uh, to the Wartburg Castle and everyone thought he had been uh, disposed of. Um, but the question of whether he ever uh, formally uh, confessed as a Protestant. Is, uh, is, is widely debated. There's, there's no indication that he... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Okay, uh, there's, no there's no indication that, um, that, he, that he formally uh, confessed as a, as a Protestant. Um, but again, this was at a period, he died in 1528, and things were, as you know, were still very much in flux in terms of confessional identities. So this is why there, there's a great deal of room for a great deal of room for um, for movement on this question. So um, uh, shades of Protestant 
uh, sensibility have in fact been detected in some of his later works, his interpretation of The Last Supper, for example, which was a key, uh, a key fixture in, um, in evangelical um, theology. Um, but there's, there's, nothing that, there's nothing that can, there's, there's, there's no spoke, smoking gun that points us to that. In terms of, I mean, I, in terms of my treatment of the religious question, I deliberately kept that in suspension for today's talk uh, simply because it gets us into some gets us into some weeds. Um, I, I, you know, throughout his whole career, he produced images for uh, for the sake of religion and piety. Um, his apocalypse series, uh, all of his major print series, he did uh, the Passion and several series, several print series, woodcuts and engravings. He did the life of the life of the the Virgin Mary in a series of so he he knew what it meant to make images for uh, for religious devotion absolutely absolutely but I think here he's working um, in you know what we'd consider a more secular context he's his audience uh, are mainly the uh, humanist scholars intellectual scientists that he uh, that he hobnobbed with and that he worked with that he was friends with and they're is even the, the possibility, which I discuss in the book, that the um, there that, that there was one principal uh, uh, target audience for this picture, and that was the Emperor Maximilian himself, who was regarded by uh, his ad advisors and his own doctors as a melancholic, was born under Saturn, had a terrible horoscope, suffered from all kinds of illnesses, um, and so this. There's some indication that he that Durer might have made this specifically to get the attention of Maximilian, or at least the humanists' circle around Maximilian. And let me ask one other very quick question. Sure. Was Durer uh, a depressed? Was he depressed? Was he melancholy? <laughs> um, he complained. You know, a lot of he's he's remarkable for the for the breadth of writings of his writings that survive. He wrote. He wrote letters. He wrote um, a little bit in a, uh, a family book of, of memory. He took he he took a diary with him on his trip to the Netherlands, and he wrote there too. He wrote theoretical treatises, and so there are scattered remarks that indicate that he was uh, a very very um, very anxious about his health, very very worried about the loss of his powers, which of course would entail loss of um, a loss of uh, a vocation and income as well. Um, but again, there's, uh, apart from that one drawing that I showed you where he's pointing to his spleen and his adoption of that uh, canonical pose of the, uh, of the depressed, of the, the depressed person in meditation. Again, there's no smoking gun that tells us that he knew he was a mel or he diagnosed himself in that way. And that, you know, talking about it that way may well also be uh, a little bit anachronistic in this case, but he definitely saw himself as a, uh, a suffering soul. Um, he identified with Jesus in the passion. There's a remarkable self-portrait that he did towards the end of his life. I didn't bring it with us, um, where he's actually seated. He's an, he's an elderly man, so his muscles have kind of gone slack and he looks a little bit depressed and he's holding the instruments of the, the passion, the whip and the, and the birch rods. Um, so there's a lot of, so again, you touch upon another monumental question in Durer scholarship. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mitch, there's a question from Hope Childers. Can you expand a bit on the now stereotypical relationship between melancholy and artistic genius? Did Durer recognize some kind of correlation? Was he making that connection explicit? Why does this stereotype linger so much even today? Oh my God, another great, another great question, which I can only answer in a very partial way. Um, there's no doubt that from an early, the, from an early time in his life, Durer um, perceived himself as someone with a special, special artistic gift. He, um, there are some inscriptions on some of his writings, uh, on some of his, on some of his works that in a sense can be read as, as boastful, like, look, I made this when I was only 20 years old, or I made, I drew myself portrait when I was 13. Um, and nobody, uh, nobody, I'm sure everyone in this room has at least seen in one art history class or another, the iconic portrait of him that's in Munich where he's facing 
facing directly out. Um, beautiful hair, beautiful beard, um, perfectly. Uh, and, and so an image of someone who clearly um, admires his own, um, his own powers. Again, the question of whether or not he connected that specifically with melancholy, whether he was now, of course, Panofsky in these in the in the this interpretation that I cited, definitely believes that Durer understood himself as a melancholic in that modern sense, the modern sense of being someone who is um, uh, both blessed with genius, but also cursed with uh, also cursed with genius. That notion. Um, you know, it can be traced. It can be traced back to some some ancient sources. Uh, the 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 Ur source for this idea is a uh, is a pseudo Aristotelian text called the Problemata, and it's there that the that the that the author uh, first asks the question: Why are so many uh, men? He says, "Men, of course. Uh, why are so many men of extraordinary ability in art, literature, philosophy, and politics?" Um, suffering from the black bile. That text was then um, resuscitated in the, in the later Middle Ages, uh, specifically by our Mar Marsilio Ficino, uh, our, uh, the, the most renowned of the Neoplatonic philosophers in Florence. And so, and from that point onward, it spreads outward. Uh, there's no doubt that the intellectuals around Durer the ones I mentioned, uh, those humanists around Durer, they read Ficino. They were translating. Um, they were translating these ancient sources. They knew about that equation of melancholy with genius. Um, but again, there's nothing that explicitly, you know, paints it that way. Uh, we have to wait for the, the, the 16th century, the 17th century. The, the notions are um, percolating and they're they're developing. Um, so there's really no single starting point for that notion, uh, but there's no doubt that it is a powerful notion, with, which, which uh, you know, remains uh, very much part of our picture of what makes artists um, special, what gives them special powers to, uh, to do what they do. Uh, Mitch, there's a question from Isabella Comé. In one of the pictures of Abby Warburg, you included in your presentation, he seemed to be wearing something interesting <laughs> on his head. I yes. was wondering if you could tell me what kind of hat that was. <laughs> uh, maybe I can, I don't know if I can go back now. Sure, I can go back. Yes. Um, he's, um, uh, I can't say exactly what kind of hat that is, but this photograph was taken on his only trip to, uh, to the United States. He came in the early 20s uh, because he wanted to basically try his hand at ethnology and he wanted to uh, investigate the Pueblo Indians. So he came specifically to, uh, to visit uh, uh, several tribes uh, of the Pueblo Indians. He, you know, he's sort of doing a kind of colonialist thing of, of putting on the hats and posing for a picture, but it was a very serious endeavor for him. Uh, because he was in the midst of um, developing his theory about the survival of ancient symbols and particularly the serpent. So he really went to go in order to witness a particular kind of shamanistic ritual called the serpent dance. I'm sure that's not what it's actually called, but it's a dance that involves live serpents. And so he, he, he went there and here he is uh, posing for a picture uh, but I, I, I can't identify the specific kind of hat. I'm sorry. Okay. Mitch, oh. uh, we're almost at time. I, I have just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, what about the dog? Um, what's the significance of dog, the dog in the picture? The significance of the dog. The dog has been, like everything, interpreted very, very variously. Um, in general, uh, iconographers point to the dog as, as a... Um, as a representation of, of the senses. Um, and uh, again, I'm not going to remember the, specifically why, but the slum, the slumbering, the slumbering dog has something to do with the, um, 
the way we the way we the way in, in sleep or any other state we become we become unguarded so you know he's a, he's a hunting dog and he's and he's fallen asleep so uh in a sense the the senses have become have become numb the senses have um uh certain kind of certain kind of vigilance that comes with wakefulness is gone um that's that's what that's that's the main trend in interpreting the dog that I, it really the dog to me doesn't fit very well with with any of these particular interpretations okay um well we're we're past time because people wow. have classes at one o'clock but uh, i would like to thank you for a wonderful and fascinating talk um well thank you very much